Hello, welcome to a movie review. Um, I did go and see Amazing Spider-Man 2 with my wife yesterday. And um, here's my non-spoiler portion of the review. Uh, one, once I'm done with this portion, I will give a warning. And for those that do not want to hear any spoilers, you can stop watching the video. Okay, so here's a non-spoiler portion. This is a very tough movie for me to rate because it's one of those movies. It's one of those movies that have a lot of good parts, but at the same time, it has a lot of bad parts. It's rare that you see a movie that have both uh, side of the spectrum and uh, you know the, the the good parts no doubt is the the spider-man peter parker andrew garfield and then emma St emma stone gwen stacy and sally phil of course playing aunt may i think uh, gwen stacy was is the star of this movie uh, the chemistry and all the scenes that she's in are just fantastic okay I can't say enough about how how wonderful she is and the chemistry between her and and Peter Parker is very real very believable because they are a couple in real life so it's not a shocking surprise um, and as well as you know, Aunt May uh, with Peter Parker, all the scenes between the two of them, the interactions are just spot on. I, in my opinion, uh, as far as uh, Harry Osborn, I like the actor that played the role. Um, I think if there is any problem with him, it's more because of the script and the writing, not his acting chop. Um, and the same can be said with Jamie Foxx. I have a lot of problem with Electro. Uh, and I don't think it's because of Jamie Foxx. I think it's more because of the way he was written. Uh, so you know, I, I'm not sure I can blame Jamie Foxx for my dislike of Electro. Uh, the story to me was rush. I would not say that they are try to cram in too much, okay? Uh, but I felt that for a movie that is just around two hours, there could have been at least ten to fifteen more minutes that can help develop the two villains in this movie further to make it more believable that's the problem with this movie is you know uh, as in many of my other reviews i always mention that for a movie to be for for for, for, for the villain to be great in a movie um, he has to be believable okay so and 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 there's a big problem with both electro and the goblin in this movie for me uh, with that being said there's a lot of plot holes in this movie but in the end because the good part of this movie were so good that i reluctantly say it is watchable and I could give it a three star out of five. You know, I would give it a B minus grade if I could, because uh, the the problem of this movie is is pretty big. But that's it. Uh, that's my non spoilers review of this movie. And for those that want to stick around um, to hear me talk with spoilers 
you can stay but otherwise thanks for watching until the next movie okay bye okay so here's the my reviews with the spoilers uh, the good parts I already mentioned you know there's not much uh, non -spo uh, spoilers that I can give as far as um, uh, this movie no doubt anyone that read the comic books know that when Stacy died and ironically on well I won't say ironically but when the first Spider-Man movie came out my wife and I went to see the movie and she really liked um, Mary Jane, uh, Gwen Stacy compared to Mary Jane of the first franchise. And on the way home from that movie, I told her that, you know, if you like Gwen Stacy, be prepared for the heartbreak because I think they would likely kill her in number two or number three eventually because that's how she was in the comic books um, so I did the best I could to avoid all interviews or spoilers or discussion of these movies because I really don't want to be spoiled so going to this movie I in the back of my mind I was prepared to see Gwen Stacy died but until the scene where she was on her way to the airport to go to London and she get on the bridge that was the moment that I said to myself oh no here it is they are going to kill her she's on the bridge top of the bridge just like in the comic books I'm not sure it's gonna happen right then right there but that's the first time in the movie that I said to myself this is it they are going to do it right here right now um, and her death scene was, you know, heartbreaking, okay, but at the same time, it was very well done. I, I think uh, Andrew Garfield and her did it so well. Here is the problem with this movie, and the problem is humongous. Um, as I mentioned before, the villain have to be believable, okay. One of the things I read recently of uh, Joe Quesada, um, the head at Marvel. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, but he he, he was criticizing DC movie. Uh, what a shock, uh, top guy at Marvel criticizing DC movies, and he was uh, criticizing that, you know, in Man of Steel, the heroes was Zod because, you know, he's a man with a conviction and he was fighting for something he believed Duh, uh, as I have mentioned in that movie review and other movies, that for me, what make a great villain is a villain that are fighting for something that he truly believe in. Uh, so you have to respect his desire to achieve his goal instead of just being pure evil. Okay, if you want a, a villain that's just pure evil. You can go watch, uh, you know, a cartoon. You know, it, it's to me, that's what make a great movie is when you have the villain that is believable, that are have good reason to be mad, have good reason to do what they want to do, and this is where this movie fail in many level. Electro, from the first get go when he joined, he popped on the screen. What the heck was going on there? I did not like the way they want to portray him as a fumbling, stumbling, geeky, lonely kind of guy. It, it's He show up looking like a homeless person with the bag come over here and then he went into Oscorp as, a, as a, you know, one of the scientists there. Everybody there are nicely dressed and perfectly it's a beautiful corporation with neat dress people and here you have this homeless looking guy working there it just make no sense it make no sense to me um, and then when 
he got his power. That's even the biggest, bigger problem for me because when he was ordered to fix the problem, and he asked someone for help, and that person turned him down because he's going home. Hello, this is a serious problem. You don't just if somebody asks you for assistance to help fix a problem, you don't say, um, "It's five o'clock. I'm going home." Okay, so okay, so that was kind of silly, but what even more silly is when he got electrocuted with the eel and all that, and then he died. To me, that was just like, why? And then you know. Waking up from the dead with the crusty skin, and then stumbling out of the, cor uh, the corner, deathbed. It it just make no sense to me. And then, to me, it would have been better if he fell down into the tank, get electrocuted, get a little bit, you know, dazed, knocked out a little bit, woke up, feeling weird with his power, and then stumbling out of Oscorp that would be better because in the next scene where he was walking through the street and the car was going off and the light was going crazy because of his charge power that would have been better off right after when he fell down and get his power instead of waking up from the dead and then when he went into Times Square it would have been better to have all the people around him as he walked through the crowd to have their cell phone not working or doing something silly. So to me, here you are just seconds ago with Electro walking through the street and everything around him was flipping out. And yet when he walked through the crowd in Times Square with everyone on their cell phone, nothing was going on. And I really didn't understand what he was trying to achieve as far as trying to get the cable power beneath the, the ground. Maybe he was hungry for power, but like I said, it's, it's a lot of action there that was kind of just like, what's going on here? And then when Spider-Man show up and intervene, that scene did not work. How Jamie Foxx Electro turned from being the normal geeky guy into a villain because somehow Spider-Man betray him. That whole interaction and how he turned from normal to evil to bad was just did not work. It the switch was a silly, okay? On top of that, here's a guy who just minutes if not hours ago, woke up from the dead. All of a sudden, now he know how to use his power. Okay, all of a sudden, okay, he know how to fly around. He know how to zap, shoot lightning bolt. All that stuff. It's just so. From that point on, I had a huge problem with Electro. Um, the other problem I had was with Harry Osborn. Um, first off, I think Norman Osborn. Chris Cooper, the character, is is not dead. You know, Chris Cooper is a pretty big time actor. You know, so I don't think hiring him to play that role make any sense for him to just lay in bed and deliver five lines and then be gone. So I think there's something more to it. Maybe he's gonna be the leader of the sinister group. Sinister Five, Sinister, I don't know, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain you will see more of Chris Cooper in the next sequel. As far as Harry Osborn, um, I like the actor, but I felt the the relationship with Peter Parker was kind of clunky as far as you know develop develop the best friend kind of thing between the two of them was kind of clunky. Um, I, I, I felt that some of the scenes between them was kind of weak. Um, at the same time, I wish they explained more on how 
Harry Osborne um, illness progress so rapidly compared to his father you know his father had the same genetic defect but it take you know 20 or 30 years to get worse and compared to uh, Harry Harry that seemed to have his symptom develop so quickly maybe the stuff that that, that little cube that his father gave him um, speed up sped up the, the, the process somehow I think that little cube has something to do with his father not dead yet and his father is using his son to I don't know like I said there's a lot of things that didn't really make sense to me but hopefully in the third movie the sequel it will become clearer but here's a problem with the Green Goblin when the Green Goblin uh, when Harry got in injected himself with the venom and then he was you know struggling to even crawl because his body is changing all that stuff how is it that he went from that into the Green Goblin like that once again just like Electro he went into full mode of power and understanding how to use the collider and all the technology that his father left behind in the lab overnight like not overnight it's right away it just he went from <laughs> almost dying into I'm the Green Goblin I know how to fly the collider zipping 100 miles an hour through the air all that stuff it just oh I I, I have a huge problem with why the movie did not take more time for both villains to show how they slowly develop and learn and discover their power part of what made Iron Man the first movie so great was practically a third of that movie is Iron Man f figuring out how to use the suit that he created how to fly how to levitate all that stuff that's what make it fun so this movie just skip all of that okay so for me even devoting an extra five minutes each for each villain to show how they you know even if Harry showing Harry stumble across the suit and the collider and then showing him going through the computer with all the manual on how to operate those things it's just it'll give us a little bit okay yes this uh, don't make us make that leap of faith so much to a point where it's silly okay um, last but not least is the ending scene with Rhino wow I can say now about how I felt that scene was silly here you are with a big gunfight okay Cops are hiding behind cars, shooting from machine guns and rockets or whatever it is that Rhino was shooting at them. And right behind, five feet, five feet behind them is just a little barricade where a, a huge crowd of spectators were standing there watching. Huh? Why? Why even? It, to me, it's just like, it makes no sense to have the crowds there. And then to have the kid come under the barricade, run to the front, and put on a mask. Whatever emotional impact that scene was designed to do, it did not work for me. It did not work for me one bit. Uh, you know, am I excited to see the Sinister Five? Um, who knows how many members of that team they give you a glimpse of Dr. Octopus, the Vulture. Okay, you have Electro, you have Rhino, you have Green Goblins, and who knows what his dad is going to be, so who knows, maybe there are six? Like I said, I try not to draw uh, everything from the comic book to the movie, you know, who knows how many they're going to include. Uh, we all know that it's not the same six member anyway, so from the comic book to the movie so you know there, there's not a big deal but 
So for that part, I'm excited. Uh, I don't think they're trying to do too much. They're trying to introduce, uh, the give you a little nuggets of the, the sequel. But like I said, that that scene with the crowds and Rhino just is just silly. Uh, but that's it. That's you know I can I I can spend a lot of time to go on with what's wrong with these movies. But I mentioned all the big problem I had with this movie. Anyhow, if you go see the movies, I'd love to hear what you think about it and what's wrong and what's right, okay? Thanks for watching.